Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guest uh, is starring with Tracy Letts, Benjamin Walker, and Annette Benning in her first Broadway performance in 32 years in Arthur Miller's post-war classic, All My Sons. In it, Francesca Carpanini plays Anne, a young widow in love with the brother of her fallen husband. Please welcome Francesca Carpanini. <laughs> oh. um, what was it like? getting this part? Because I imagine they were already cast. It was pretty well known that they were going to be reviving this play with them. So what was the whole process like for you? Yeah, as soon as I found out they were doing this play, I sent an email directly to my representatives <laughs> saying, how do you get me in? Um, because I love this play and I love this character. Um, and I... So you were familiar with the... What is it about this Arthur Miller play? I mean, this is a huge art play in Arthur Miller's career, but it's also the end of a period of his yeah. career as well. Um, I mean, I, I what the play speaks about, I think, is so resonant and important in this time. And it feels like such an honor to be doing a play that's reflecting the issues that we're struggling with as a country back to the people in the seats. Um, and then also, I had actually worked on the role a bit when I was at Juilliard in my first year. And my teacher, Richard Feldman, who is a genius and I owe so much of anything I do to him, uh, he had given me notes on it and I went back before my audition and looked at my little acting journal and saw what he had said to me about the character and it kind of opened her up again for me in a really important way that I think helped me so much when I was even just going in for my first audition to kind of crack her a little bit. Um, and because I'd had that experience working on it in school, I knew that there was something about her that uh, was both an exciting challenge for me, but that also something that I innately understood about her. Um, so it just, and then obviously Tracy Letts and that Benning. What's so fascinating about, uh, about your character's journey in it is that it's inner turmoil the entire time for him. Everybody else sort of has the chance to externalize everything that they're feeling, but your character has to ride for the most part with this inner turmoil, and the decision that she makes is sort of sudden, and it's not really, it's unclear. It, to me, it's unclear as to whether, like how she actually feels about the decision that she's made. It's kind of like, this is what I'm deciding, I'm just gonna stick to that because there's really no better option for me. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of people, when they talk about this play, they sometimes don't understand why Anne does the things she does. Mm. And there's a lot of things that are challenging and difficult about this play and difficult about this character, but the one thing I always understood was why she both doesn't uh, reveal the letter earlier and why she reveals it when she does. Um, I think when you have gone through something really, truly heartbreaking, that's made you question everything you knew and put you into what I imagine was a large depression um, after she, after her father went to jail. Um, and her and, husband passed away in yes. the war. Yeah. I think when you find something that makes you feel even an inch of happiness or an inch of hope that maybe life has something good to come for you, you will do anything it takes to hold on to that. And so while it pains her and hurts her and is the last thing, last thing she wants to do to bring this letter to this family and give them this terrible, devastating news, I think that that desire to pull herself out of the worst time of, in her life trumps everything. Yeah, I, I never questioned what, why she opened the letter when she did. She clearly wants to protect this yeah. family, which is almost has to happen because she loves this man mm -hmm. and she wants to be with him. And if she destroys this family, she destroys him. Yes. Um, but it's more once she kind of knows the truth about the other thing that is in, in regards to the family, she kind of has to cast it aside. Well, you mean cast aside what she knows about the Kel about Joe? I don't know if she casts it aside. I mean, I don't think she's planning to... I think she wants to marry Chris. I think that she plans to still be with him because... Pull him out of there? Yeah, she wants to pull him out of there. But I don't think she ha I don't think she's forgiving of what Joe has done. I think it's more that she wanted to protect Joe and Kate for a long time because she loved them like parents. And as soon as she finds out that actually everything they've been doing is a lie... Um, her only concern becomes her and Chris's life together in the future. 
it's so uh, strange to talk about uh, a revival play right now because um, so often I have to avoid spoilers yes. on this stage, and there is like this deep intrinsic. Now there's like this deep intrinsic thing in me that's like, don't give the story <laughs> away for me. But this is a play from like nineteen what fifty one forty forty seven forty seven mm -hmm. right. It takes place in forty. It takes place in it, it, at the it, time we had that a lot of written. debate about it, but it's for he, he really finished it in forty seven, and it was performed for the first time in forty seven. And that's when it takes place mm -hmm. as well as forty seven. Just a few. Yes. Yeah, right after the war. Um, so were you a big Arthur Miller fan when you were at Juilliard? I, I mean, it'd be crazy to be a theater person and be like, no. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, he's, he's our supreme dramatist. And I think this play in particular, really, cr when we talk about, we talk a lot of in theater about the well-made play. And I think that this play is one of the supreme examples of it. And perhaps even the thing that really truly set the form for yeah. a family drama that makes us laugh, that pulls us in, that provides one twist and then another twist and then another twist that you don't even realize is coming. Well, he kind of wrote the rules, right? Because yeah. if you look at who the big person was, the big man was before him, it was Eugene O'Neill. Mm -hmm. And when you go see a Eugene O'Neill play, the rules don't really feel as set in stone as yeah. they do when you come when you come to an Arthur Miller play. Yeah. Um, so that's amazing and is so, uh, it's such a support as an actor, particularly in this play where you have to go to such dark, dark places and emotional places, he really takes care of you because the writing is so good. Um, but then also, all of his plays deal with really important questions, and they're utterly timeless. Um, you know, it, this play is particularly timely right now. Why I mean, do you say that? Um, for many reasons. I mean, it's about planes falling out of the sky, and it's about people who neglected the safety of individuals for their own profit. Um, all you have to do is listen to the daily <laughs> podcast, uh, the New York Times podcast, to know that that's what we're dealing with. And, we're, and then in general, um, what's going on in our government. And I think we're all, as Americans right now, particularly leading up to the election, trying to reckon with who we are as a people and who we want to be moving forward, who, we're, who we should be taking care of, um, and how we should be doing that. Yes. And this is ex that's exactly what he's asking. Yeah. Um, so much of the play that I found uh, mirrored right now was the, the, um, the young trying to take care of the sins of the, the, the elders mm -hmm. and trying to make better the world that they have destroyed yes. morally in some ways, trying to ungray the moral areas that they have kind of created. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the, the, one of the last lines of the play, Chris... Uh, Annette's character asks uh, Benjamin's character, what more can we be? What more can we do? And he says, you can be better. And I think about that every day when I listen to what's happening uh, in Washington. And when I look at particularly Republicans, um, it's we have elected a man who uh, is an unfit leader. And that's where we are. But you can be better. You can try to strive for some sense of uh, responsibility. Um, that's so much what, so much of this play is about responsibility to others um, and about young people who have a certain kind of idealistic idea of uh, who should who what what oh yeah, just responsibility. I don't know I'm getting I'm getting off now. No, not at all. Um, They're big themes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Annette Benning is um, phenomenal in the show. Mm -hmm. And um, there is something very unexpected and I think unexpected for a big star performance in a Broadway show. She very quickly sheds that in, yeah. in, in a lot of the choices that she makes and it's, it's incredible to watch. What was it like to go through the rehearsal process with her and to sort of see her come up with who um, Kate <laughs> was going to yes. be? Um, it's amazing to watch Annette. Annette I've never met, I've worked with some really wonderful actors and they all have different things that I've learned from them. But from Annette, I have learned to never, ever, ever stop asking questions. She, you will think that you have cracked a scene and then she will ask another question that just opens up a whole new world. She is relentless in excavating the text. Um, and it's so humbling because you, you have these ideas about these great 
actors that they have it all figured out. And then you get to watch them in rehearsal and you get to watch them not know. Yeah. And you get to watch them experiment. And that is so exciting. Um, and she's also just warm and wacky and funny um, and supportive and always game for trying anything. I bet you get that. I don't know if you write, but getting that when you get to talk to Tracy a little bit, because someone who is a Pulitzer who's written the plays that he's written, you get the sense that he has everything worked out. But I bet if you talk to him, he's like, I'm lost. I'm trying to write these things and figure them out while I'm working on them. Yeah, I mean, this play is a beast. This play is so hard. And I, so many times we would finish a run, of the, a run of the play in the rehearsal room or even in our previews, and we would come off and just be like, God, this play is really hard. Why? Um... The places it asks you to go are incredibly demanding. Emo so emotionally Emotionally demanding. But also I think pitching the orchestration of the play is really tricky because you have the first act, you have the second act, which ends, ends in this really dramatic conclusion. And then you have a whole nother act to go. And so Jack O'Brien, our director, would talk a lot about that third act as being what happens when you've spent all your emotional energy. What happens, what, what comes, what bubbles to the surface after you've shed the tears and you've yet, like, what happens when you're emotionally spent? Um, and I think that was a fascinating place to work from for that act and what made it really difficult. So you go into the third act intentionally exhausted. Uh, sort of, yeah. I think, I think we sort of, we wanted to try drying it out and... Um, because these, they've been sitting for hours since the end of the second act. So they've cried their tears. Um, they've had their sighs and their sobs. And what happens after that? What kind of desperation comes to the surface? What kind of... When you, when you kind of don't have any shits left to give, you know? You're just... You're going to... Particularly for Anne, I'm going to go after what I want. And I don't have the emotional space to manage other people's emotions or manage other people's expectations or their feelings. Um, and I think something really interesting happens dramatically in that space. Right, because that's what she was initially there to do. She was there to get this thing that she wanted mm -hmm. while at the same time managing everybody else's emotions and making sure that nobody was unhappy with her while she got the thing that she wanted. But by the third act, it's just get out <laughs> with the thing that you want. Exactly. Hope, hopefully no one gets hurt. Or yeah, no it's one like, dies. okay, well, if, if everyone seems to be corrupt except me and my fiance, so I'm taking him and I'm leaving. Yeah. Um, so what was it like? I mean, what's it like working with Tracy Lutz? I love Tracy so much. I adore that man. Um, I was really, really nervous to work with him uh, and to meet him more so than other people people I've worked with I think because he's not just an actor he's a genius playwright um, and so I was intimidated at first but he is the biggest softy on the planet he is so kind he is so generous and he just loves a good laugh I, I never thought that I would be laughing as much with Tracy Lutz as I am like we just have the same humor we crack each other up and in this play, which is so dark, it's so nice to laugh. <laughs> like, we are a silly, silly, silly cast, and I think we need that because otherwise we would not be able to get through <laughs> the play. So before and after the show, you guys are all cracking jokes together? Yeah, it's we, we keep it silly, we keep it fun, we keep it light. Um, it's, it's too hard to do something like this eight times a week and not find the joy and the humor. Um, and, yeah, he, he plays really like funky music after the show's over he'll play or he he was playing he was playing like 1999 by prince i think <laughs> the other day at the end of the show and he was like you know you can't leave here with the, you, you can't leave here with this and take this play home with you so when you guys i mean if you when you bring it all out on the stage and you are crying and then the show is over do you find that oftentimes actors like sort of congratulate each other on really going there or is it kind of like we all did it let's let's move on and talk about something else now um, we're definitely very supportive of each other's work, um, and de there's definitely compliments, but we're also, we also, we're also kind of a no fuss, no muss cast. Um, you know, everyone here is doing this play because we love the theater, and we love Arthur Miller, and we love this piece. No one's in it for ego, no one's in it to give a, to have some star performance turn, even though that is 
happening because of the incredible work that um, people are doing on the stage. But we really, uh, we keep it light and we'll, we'll go, we go out after, we'll go for to Joe Allen, we'll go for a burger and we'll usually not talk about the play. <laughs> <laughs> you're kind of you're kind of done talking about the play at this point, right? No more changes are being made. You're yeah, you're, it's on its feet, and you guys are going eight times a week. Yeah, and but at the same time, we do keep it a little loose on stage. I've never been in something that changes quite so much night tonight. I mean, the structure stays the same, um, but Jack really allowed us to be a little bit wild with it. Um, you sort of have to be with it, yeah. right? Because there's. Um, I don't know how to articulate this, but there's so much talking and often, especially within the first act, there's so much talking that is not plot oriented and is sort of just introducing characters, which plays rarely do yes. these days, I think. There is a good sh sort of shaggy 10, 15 minutes of the first act, which is wonderful to watch when you love theater, but that has to feel a little loose and it can't feel as directed as most sort of plot driven dialogue is. Yeah, we really try to let it be free. Um, and we, in rehearsal, whenever we would kind of raise our hand and say, I feel like I'm in a play. And that was always a bad sign. It was always like, okay, let's, let's rework it. Let's figure out how to make this more natural, to make this more easeful. Um, and then for me, um, I that's do. So yeah. I mean, that's, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, Go but ahead. that's so smart to do that to you guys in rehearsal because it did write the rules of what, like you said, the modern three act play really yeah. is. And so therefore like, since that has been done so many times since then, you have to find a new way to make it feel alive. Otherwise it is going to feel like a play. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's so liberating and fun. And for, for me, I credit so much of that, or at least my ability to attempt that or to do that to working with Benjamin Walker because so much of what I do in the play is with him. Um, I really feel like he's my partner through this odyssey of a piece and he's just the perfect amount of um, trust. I feel so safe. I never feel like our scene is going to go off the rails. I always I always feel like I, it's going to reach the point it needs to reach. But at the same time, because of that, I feel so free to try new things and to really actually talk talk to each other yeah. uh, rather than feel set in one way of doing it. Especially in Act 2, right? Isn't Act 2 primarily yours and Ben's um, portion of the play? Yeah, we have a ton of stuff in Act 2. I, and even in scenes where there's somebody else on stage uh, or it's with multiple other people, I always feel like a kind of a tether to him, even in moments where we're not speaking. And I think that's the nature of, you know, being in love with somebody, you always are kind of uh, aware of what's going on with him. So as Anne, I'm always aware of what's going on with Chris. Right, you're always checking in. Yes, exactly. Just a glance. Exactly, just a little look. Um, but it's, yeah, it ends. I'm just so, I, so much about doing this play at this time with this cast um, is a blessing, but truly one of the biggest is getting to do it with him as Chris because he's just such an amazing actor and I think um, what he's doing with the role is so special and so much, everything I do is because of him. Um, and so to have, a, to have a Chris that is just ticks every box is amazing. Um, we have a question coming in from Twitter. Uh, if we can pull that up, it's how did performing in this show change you as a person? Ooh, as a person. It's from Shilliam Wakespeare. Thanks, Shilliam Wakespeare. Um, Get the reference. <laughs> how did the performing in this show change you as a person? Um, it's definitely changed the way I approach it as an a I approach the work as an actor, and just as I was saying, allowing things to be a little bit more free. Um, and then how would it how it changed me as a person uh i mean i think i already think a, i think very politically and i already think a lot about um the future of the country and the future of the world but being in a play that literally asks the people on stage to be better every night can't help but affect who i am off stage and the kinds of things I feel responsible towards and responsible for as um, a member of society, not just in the United States, but across the world. 
Um, we have a couple questions in the audience. Who's the first victim? Right here. Hi. Hey, Francesca, how you doing? Uh, you've done great work, and um, I want to just ask you real quick. You know, you're obviously picking up picking up a lot of momentum in your career, but um, when it's all said and done, what are like two monumental milestones that you think you want to really reach? Oh, I want to reach? Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, I think the more you do, the, the longer I'm in this profession, the more I think that the biggest milestone of all is to be consistently employed. That sounds really lame, um, but you know, I've had long stretches of time between jobs. Um, I know people who have had much longer. I have no complaints. But to, to be able to support yourself solely as an actor, to not have to have a side job that you run off to in between, or I've even had times when I've been in a play, but I'm still working another job at the same time just to make a little extra money, particularly in theater where you don't make very much. To just be able to support myself solely as an actor, like. I've won the jackpot. Like I don't care about awards. I don't. I, I, that's what I want to do. I just want to be telling stories. Um, and then I'd really like to originate a role in a musical. That would be really exciting, um, particularly because when those are the th the cast albums are the things that I grew up when I was a 13 year old fangirl listening to. And so the idea of being on one of them and having another 13-year-old sing a song that I sang in their room like I did would be a dream come true. Uh, one more. Hello. So you said that this play was uh, had so many layers and was very emotionally like exhausting. So my question is, going into it, did you know it was going to be like this emotionally like exhausting and how did you prepare for it? I knew it would be emotionally exhausting. I didn't realize quite how much it would be because I've done a lot of dramas. I did, um, my, I made my Broadway debut in The Little Foxes two years ago and that was a very dramatic role and a very dramatic end to the play that my character had. But there's something about the length of time the 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 length of this play and the amount of time i spend on stage that just there's no like going off to my dressing room and going on instagram and eating candy and chatting to people it's pretty much like when i go on stage i'm 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 in that world the whole time which is the joy of it because i feel like a pig rolling around in mud in this completely immersive experience on stage but it also just means that i do spend a full two and a half hours at like my peak concentration. Um, and then how I prepared for it, I mean, I always just read the play a lot. Um, but then I think the most important preparation in general is just taking care of yourself in the day before you do the show at night. Um, you know, really eating well, exercising, not tiring yourself out, not talking too much. It sounds really boring, but it's not only just taking care of yourself so you don't get sick. It also just doesn't, you don't, you can't expend all your energy before eight o'clock when the show starts. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever worry about how much you exercise on a day of the show? I'd be I, curious. Is there like a sweet spot? There's for sure a sweet spot, but I definitely, I need to, and sometimes I don't, but I do need to like move my body a little bit in some way before I do the show. Cause I feel like if I'm emo if I'm physically warmed up, my emotions, come easier um, but my dressing room is five flights up at the American <laughs> Airlines Theater so even if I don't have time to do any kind of a workout simply getting to my costume is quite the uh, quite the cardio <laughs> um, I love the play congratulations Thank I mean of you. course I love the play it's Arthur Miller it's an incredible cast including yourself it's currently uh, at the American Airlines Theater it's all my sons everybody please give Francesca Carbonini a huge round of applause for being here and for Thank her work you. Thank you.